to this lecture where we're going to be getting started with Django. We finally reached the moment we've been waiting for throughout the whole course using our Python skills and all our front end skills along with the Django web framework. But before we actually dive into the technical details of Django, let's learn a little more about it and its really interesting background. Django is a free and open source web framework. And being a web framework, it really allows us to solve two major problems. It allows us to map a requested URL from a user to the code that's actually meant to handle it. And then it also allows us to create that requested HTML dynamically. So using templates, which we'll learn about later on, we can actually inject calculated values or information from the database into an HTML page to show to the user. So we're gonna be really connecting all the front end stuff to the back end stuff through this web framework. And Django is extremely popular. It's used by many sites, including things such as Pinterest, PBS, Instagram, Bitbucket, Washington Times, Mozilla, and much more. You can check out the official Django website for a whole list of example websites that operate using Django's web framework. Django was created in 2003 when the web developers at the Lawrence Journal World Newspaper started using Python for their development. And the fact that it originated at a newspaper is actually really important to the culture that surrounds Django. Because the original developers were surrounded by those newspaper writers, good written documentation is a key part of Django. And we're gonna be exploring the documentation as we go along through this part of the course. And that also means that you have excellent references to check out on the official Django documentation pages. Django has its own excellent basic tutorial where you're basically walk through creating a basic polling web application. And I would definitely suggest that you check out that polling tutorial later on throughout this course. And also the reason it's a poll is because that also extends back to its newspaper roots. If you're on a newspaper website, you may want to poll your readers to see whether or not they agree with the topic of a story. So when encountering Django tutorials, you're going to often read that you should use what's called a virtual environment, or you'll sometimes also see it as VENV. -E Let's talk about what a virtual environment is, how to use it, and why it's so important to use one whenever you're working with Django for a large project. A virtual environment allows you to have a virtual installation of Python and packages on your computer. So why would you ever actually want or need this? You've already installed Python, why bother with a virtual environment? Python packages change and get updated often. And there are changes that sometimes break backwards compatibility that your web application or web project may depend on. So what do you do if you want to test out the new features of a package update, but you also don't wanna break your current web application? After all, you can't just take down your website every time a package gets updated. Well, that's where a virtual environment comes in. You can create a virtual environment that contains the newer version of the package or a virtual environment for your older version of the package. And luckily, Anaconda makes this really easy for us. A virtual environment handler is already included. So to use this virtual environment with Conda, you're gonna use the following commands. And we'll walk through this in just a little bit. But the Conda create command initiates the virtual environment. So we say Conda create space, dash, dash, name, and then another space, and you type in the name of your environment. So in this case, I've called my environment my env there. And then the last word there, Django, is going to say, well, what package do I want to initiate this environment with? And Conda requires that. So you will say Conda create, dash, dash, name, the name of your virtual environment, and then the package that you want to start that environment with. And later on, you can specify a specific version for that package. So you can say Django, something like equals equals 1.9 or 1.8, 1.10, etc. And then you can activate that environment with activate space, the name of the environment. And this all happens at the command line. Now, anything installed with pip or conda when this environment is activated will only really be installed for that environment. So that allows you to create separate versions of packages and pythons all on one computer with the use of these virtual environments. And then you can deactivate the environment with deactivate my env or the name of the environment. And it's highly encouraged to use virtual environments for your projects to keep them self-contained and not run into issues when packages are updated. All right, so let's jump to our command line and show you an example of actually creating a virtual environment. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor. And before we get started by walking through a virtual environment using Conda, what I wanted to point out is that Conda itself has really good documentation 
on creating virtual environments or managing environments, and it's linked to in the resource notes, but let me jump to that website real quick over here and show you what it looks like. Just go to conda.io slash doc slash using slash envs for environments.html or just Google search conda environments should take you to this page or just use the resource link. But this has a lot more details than what we're going to be showing here. Shows you how to create an environment, change an environment, clone an environment, remove, etc. So if you ever have any questions further than what we discuss here, you have uh, this documentation that will walk you through all of these steps. So what we're going to be doing is creating an environment. And there's an example here, conda create dash dash name. They're calling their environment snowflakes and it uses biopython. So let's actually create a virtual environment that will create a virtual environment for Django for us. So I will come back to Adam, click plus here to open up my terminal. And then what I will do is say this, conda create dash dash name and let's call this my Django ENV, and then I will type Django because that's the package I want to initiate my Django ENV or environment with. I will hit enter, and what it's going to do is download that Django package if I don't have it already, and then apply it to that virtual environment. And Conda is actually pretty smart, and it will know that if you have already a similar version of Django somewhere installed on your computer, it may not need to copy it, it will just reference it. That way you don't need to download anything, it will just reference previous installations. I don't have Django on this computer yet, so what it will do is fetch that metadata, and let me expand this to show you what happens, and it will ask you, hey, these new packages are going to be installed, is that okay with you? And I will say no right now, because I actually don't want Python 2.7, I want Python 3. So what I'm going to do is say no on proceed, and instead I will say this, conda create name, and let's say my Django env, and instead of starting it with Django, I'm going to start it with Python 3. And the reason I'm doing this is to show you an example of specifying a specific version of Python or a package. So it's a very similar process. You say conda create dash dash name, the name of your actual environment. And in this case, instead of a package, I will say Python. And then you say equals, and then you type in the version number you want. So for instance, I want Python 3.5. I'm going to hit enter. It will fetch that package metadata again. It will show me the new packages that will be installed. Here I can see that I have the correct version of Python I want, 3.5. You can also do uh, 3.6 depending on when you're actually viewing this course, if that's been added to Conda. But let's stick with something 3.4 or above. So 3.4, 3.5, 3.6, those should all work fine for what we're going to be doing. I'm going to proceed on that, select Y, and then I will jump forward in time for this to all be downloaded and installed. I'll see you there. All right, so that has finished installing, and now we actually get the instructions. So to activate this environment, we can use activate, and then the name of the environment, and then to deactivate it, once we're done using it, we can say deactivate, and that will deactivate the environment. And if we ever wanna use it again, we can easily just activate it with the activate command. And if you're on a Mac or Linux computer and you're using bash, you'll probably have to use source, so keep that in mind. All right, now that we've set up our actual environment, it's time to activate it. A quick note, in case you forget what environments you have on your computer, you can easily list them through this command, conda info dash dash envs, and this will list out all the environments you have. Here I just have my default anaconda, the root environment, and then this environment I created, my Django env. And depending on what anaconda version you initially installed, this may say anaconda 3 instead of anaconda 2. But let's actually activate this environment if you're on Linux or Mac OS and you're using Bash, you will probably have to say source, activate, and then the name of the environment, Django ENV. Since I'm on a Windows computer right now, I don't need to specify source. So let's bring that back down to just activate my Django ENV. I hit enter, 
and it will activate the environment. And the way I can tell that the environment is activated is you should see here in parentheses my Django ENV. And that means that everything I do right now in regards to Python is going to only take effect on this environment. Which means if I decide to install Django in this environment, it's only going to be installed that specific version of Django for this virtual environment. In fact, let's do that now. I will say conda install Django, hit enter, and this will install the latest version of Django. And for this course, basically any version of Django that's higher than 1.8 should work just fine. So 1.8, 1.9, or at the time of this course, 1.10 should be fine. Let's say proceed Y, but I do encourage you to at least use 1.10. That way everything we do in this course matches up exactly with what's on your computer. Okay, I'm going to hop forward in time for this to finish installing and downloading. All right, so that finished installing Django to this virtual environment. And if I wanna confirm if this virtual environment is actually working correctly, I can just type in Python into this command line. And I notice that the version of Python here matches the version of the environment. If I were to say quit, and then deactivate this environment. So if I just say deactivate, notice I'm no longer in the virtual environment. So if I say Python now, I am back to my original installation of Python, which happened to be this 2.7 version. So that's a nice little confirmation that you're in the virtual environment and you're actually doing effects on that environment. Let's say quit and we're ready to go. Okay, so we did a lot of housekeeping stuff in this lecture, haven't actually dived into Django, but a lot of this stuff is really important and it's going to clear you of headaches later on if you don't learn how to actually use virtual environments correctly. So by this lecture, you should have a full understanding of virtual environments, at least how to create them, activate them, and deactivate them. You can always reference that link in the resources if you want more information about the environments. And you should have installed Django to your virtual environment. Coming up next, we're actually going to get started with using Django. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone, and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing creating your first Django project. In future lectures, we'll actually discuss the difference between a Django project and a Django application. But by the end of this lecture, we should be able to actually run a Django project, a little server locally, and see it in our browser. In case you haven't done so already, you'll need to install Django. You can do that either with a conda install Django or for a normal Python distribution, pip install Django. And remember, if you're using a virtual environment, you should activate the virtual environment before running any of the command lines commands that we actually do throughout this section of the course. So when you install Django, it's actually also going to install a command line tool called Django-admin. And this command line tool is just a useful feature for us to quickly run things straight from the command line. So what we can do is create our first project. And for that, just go to your command prompt, activate your virtual environment if you haven't done so already, and then say Django-admin space start project space and then whatever you want your project to be called. In this case, we will say first underscore project. And then you're gonna get something that looks like this and we'll explain what all these files are in just a second. But before we do, let's actually run this code. I'm going to jump to the Atom text editor, open up a command prompt, and run through this. All right, here I am at the Atom text editor. What I will do is open up a new terminal or command prompt, and I'm going to change directory to my desktop and actually make a new folder. So I will say mkdir that's make directory, same for Mac or Windows users. And I'm just going to make a new folder on my desktop to contain all the Django code that we're gonna be working with for this particular section of the course. If you already have a folder like that, you can just change directory into that folder. But what I will do is I will say my Django stuff. So I will make that directory and then I will CD into my Django stuff and there I have it. So I have that directory made, and what I will do now is just add that to Atom. So I will say file, add a project folder, go to my desktop, my Django stuff is there, select that folder, and I can see it here now. Great. So now let's actually create that first project using that Django-admin command line tool. 
Before I do that though, I'm going to want to activate the virtual environment I created in the previous lecture. If you're not using a virtual environment, that's okay. Just make sure you've installed Django. So I will say activate. Remember if you're using Mac or Linux, you want to say source activate and then the name of the Django environment. And that one was just called my Django ENV. Hit enter and now that's activated. And then what I'm going to do is call the Django command line tool. I will say Django dash admin start project and then whatever you want to call this very first project we're working on. In this case I'll keep it simple and just say first underscore project. Hit enter and this is actually going to create that first project. So what you will notice now is in this directory I've created my first project here. And here I have the first project folder and you should have a nested folder of the same name and then a couple files that init.py file, settings.py, urls.py, wsgi, and then manage.py. What we're going to do now is take a little bit of time to explain what each of these files does. And you'll notice that one of them is empty. That's okay. That's the way it should be. And what I want you to do is check out these various files as I go along back to the presentation and explain in very brief detail what all of these files actually are doing. Let's hop back to the presentation. Okay, so here are the command lines we just initiated. And after that, we should get something like this. So let's take a little bit of time to explain what's actually going on here. Let's go th first through that init.py file. So that underscore underscore init underscore underscore dot pi file, that's actually just a blank Python script. And due to its special name, it lets Python know that this directory can be treated as a package. Then we have the settings.py file, and this is where we're actually going to be storing all of our project settings. Then we have the urls.py file, and this is essentially a Python script that's going to store all the URL patterns for your project. And that's basically going to relate to the different pages of your web application and how they should connect to the end user. Now keep in mind this particular file is really going to make a lot of use of regular expressions. So before tackling this urls.py file in future lectures, make sure you review the regular expressions lecture from the Python section of this course. Then we have that wsgi.py file, and that's a Python script that acts as the web server gateway interface. And essentially what it's going to help us with is later on, when we actually want to deploy our web app to production on some online server, that file is going to help us out there. Then we have the manage.py, and that's under that top directory. And this is a Python script that we're going to be using a lot it's going to be associated with many of the commands we use as we build our web project and web application. Okay, so now let's actually use manage.py. In your command line, what I want you to do is, after activating your virtual environment, of course, type python space manage.py space run server. So here what we can actually see what's happening is we're calling python to run that manage.py file, and off of that py file, we actually want to specifically call that run server command. And what you're going to see is a bunch of stuff, but at the bottom, you should see something that looks like this. Your particular version of Django, the settings you're using, and then it's starting a development server at a URL. And what you will do is copy and paste that URL into your browser, and you should now see your very first web page being locally hosted on your computer. And that's a big congratulatory step because you now just ran your very first Django project. Let me walk you through all of that back at the Atom text editor. All right, we're back at the Atom text editor, and before I run that python manage.py run server command, I want to make sure I'm in the right directory so that I can actually find it when I call it. So notice here that if I collapse that folder, it's under my Django stuff, under first project, that very first folder. So what I will do here is cd to that first project folder, and here's where I'm going to call that actual command. I will say python manage.py run server and then hit enter and actually run this. Okay, so you'll notice I get some outputs here and sometimes you'll actually get a warning in red coloring but here uh, due to this newer version of Django it's not such a noticeable red warning but it will tell you that you have some unapplied migrations and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. More importantly we see here that it's starting the development server at this particular URL. So what I want you to do is copy this, just right click that and copy it, or just type it straight into your browser, 
and put it into your browser. All right, so I've jumped to my browser and I've typed in that URL and you'll get something that looks like this. It worked. Congratulations on your first Django powered page. So this is pretty awesome. We actually have something running locally on our computer and it says welcome to Django as the title. And of course, we haven't actually done any work yet, but the next step is to actually start our first application by running something that looks like this. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But a quick little message, it'll say something like, you're seeing this because you have debug is equal to true. So in our Django settings file, we actually have a debug option that we can set to true or false. And we'll talk about that later on in future lectures. And as we build our website, we'll always have it to true. But when we want to actually push something to production, we'll make sure to turn it to false. So that way, if an error arises, the user doesn't have access to our debugging tools with Django. OK, now what I want to talk about is that migrations warning. So if I minimize this and come back to right here in Atom, we see we have 13 unapplied migrations. Let's take a little bit of time to discuss what migrations actually are and how they relate to the database when you're using Django. All right, so as we just noted, we have our very first Django powered application or project running locally in our computer. So a big congratulations to you, pat yourself on the back. But as I mentioned, we noticed that warning about migrations and this has to do with databases and how to connect them to Django. The question arises, what is a migration? Well, a migration allows you to move databases from one design to another. And this is also reversible and that's why it's called a migration. Let's say you have a database and you want to edit a new field or add something like a new column, you can go ahead and migrate those changes over. And you can actually reverse that as well. So you can migrate your database. We're going to touch back on this later, especially when we actually talk about connecting Django to a database. But for now, you can ignore this warning. I know it says in that command prompt to run some sort of migrations uh, command at the command line. Right now, we'll just uh, back off on this and keep it in the back of our minds. So that was it as far as the basics of getting started with Django. We started our first Django project, but up next we're going to continue by creating a very simple Hello World Django application. I hope you're excited because now we're actually going to get right into the nitty gritty of working with Django. Thanks everyone, and I will see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing how to create our first Django application with a very simple view. So far, we've been able to use Run Server to test our installation of Django. Now let's move on to actually creating our first Django application. We'll learn about views and how to use them. Let's get some terminology straight though before we continue. A Django project is a collection of applications and configurations that when combined together is going to make up the full web application or website. That's your complete website running with Django. A lot of times people use the term web application to describe a website. So try not to get it confused with a Django application. A Django application is created to perform a particular functionality for your entire web application. So for example, you could have a registration Django application or a polling Django application, a comments Django application. So a polling app, comments app, etc. These Django apps or Django applications can then be plugged into other Django projects so you can reuse them or more importantly, use other people's Django applications. This process of being able to take a Django application and plug it into another Django project leads to the terminology of pluggable Django applications. Okay, let's continue on by creating a simple application with the following command. We'll go back and use that manage.py file. We're going to be using it a lot throughout the course. And we'll say Python manage.py start app and then first underscore app. So within our Django project, we're creating a Django application. I'm going to jump to Atom to get started. All right, here I am back at the Atom text editor. And right now I'm located under the first project directory, that top level directory. And you'll notice we also get this db.sqlite3. When we ran our server from last time, we can just uh, let it be for now and ignore it. What we want to do is with our virtual environment activated, actually create that first simple Django application. So what I'm going to type is Python manage.py. And then the keyword here is start app and then whatever you want to call this first application. Since we're doing something really basic like a hello world type app, I'm just going to say first underscore app. Hit enter 
And you'll notice that we now get this first app inside of our first project directory. So this is a Django application. You'll see that it looks kind of similar to what we had when we actually ran our first project, but we get some different files here. We get views, tests, models, apps, admin, and in it. Let's discuss what all of these files stand for and how they all work. I'm going to jump back to the presentation now. Okay, so we created all those files with that start app command. Now let's discuss what all these files are for. Here we have another init.py file, and that's serving the exact same purpose as we discussed previously. It's just a blank Python script that, due to its special name, lets Python know that this directory can be treated as a package. Then we have the admin.py, and this is where you can register your models so that you can benefit from some Django machinery that basically creates an admin interface for you. And later on, we'll see how fantastic the built-in admin features of Django are. It's a really powerful tool, and it's all built into Django. Then we have the apps.py file, and that essentially provides a place for any application-specific configuration. Then we have the models.py, and this is going to be a place to store your application's data models. And that's where you're going to specify the entities and relationships between the data. And that will make a lot more sense when we actually begin to play with that file. Then we have the test.py file, and this is where you can store a series of functions to test out your application's code. Then we have views.py, which is where you can store a series of functions that handle requests and return responses. Then finally, we have that migrations directory or migrations folder. And this directory stores database specific information as it relates to the models. So the views.py and the models.py are the two files you're going to be using for any given application. And the form part of that main architectural design pattern employed by Django is the model view template pattern. And you can check out the official Django documentation to see how models, views, and templates all relate to each other in a lot more detail. But before we get started with any of this, we actually need to tell Django that we just created this application. We need to let it know that first underscore app actually exists. So what we'll do is go back to the settings.py file of our project and add in that first app. Then once Django knows about the application's existence, we can learn the process of creating a view and mapping it to our URL to complete this entire process. Let's jump back to the Atom text editor and do all of these tasks. Okay, here I am back at Atom text editor. And what I wanna do is check out this settings.py that was created when we first created our project. And again, these are the Django settings for the first project project. If we scroll down, we'll see a bunch of variables. The one we're looking for is called installed apps. And here they are. We see installed apps, and it's essentially what a list is with uh, some string application definitions. And what we need to do is add in our own application, this first underscore app. You can see here that Django automatically adds its own default apps like authorization, administration apps, messages, etc., static files, all of which we're going to be discussing in future lectures. But right now, let's add in as a string that application we just created, which is first underscore app. And then what we will do is save this. I can just do control S to save that, and that's saved. And with Adam, what's nice is there'll be a little blue dot here to let you know that you haven't saved it yet. To make sure all of this actually worked, we're just going to run the server again one more time and make sure we have no errors. So I will say Python space manage.py and then select that run server command. Hit enter and as long as I don't get any errors then everything should be working fine. I can just copy and paste this into a browser. Whoops, looks like I did control C which makes sense. Let's run that again. And I should right click this, so highlight that, copy it, and I'm going to input it into a browser and make sure it's working. And you can see here that I've input it into a browser on my other screen. I'm going to drag it over real quick, and we see that everything is still working. Good. That means the first app is working fine on the installed apps, so I will do Control c to exit out of that. The next step that we want to do is actually create a view. So now that our first app application has been created, what we can do is create a simple view. And for our very first view, we're going to just send some back some simple text, like a hello world. We won't concern ourselves with actually using models or templates just yet. We're going to discuss that in a future lecture. So what we will do is open up the views.py. 
right here. And this is under our, let me minimize this. This is under our application folder. So we have views.py and it says from django.shortcuts import render. What we need to do is add in a little bit of code here. We also need to say from django.http import HTTP response. And then I'm going to create a function called index and that's going to take in request. And then it's going to return HTTP response and I'm just going to pass in a string here that says hello world. Okay, so let's discuss line by line what's actually happening here. First, we had to import HTTP response object from the Django.HTTP module. And then each view for this application is going to exist within that views.py file as its own individual function. And in this instance, we just created one view called index with that index function. And each view is also going to take in at least one argument. And for that HTTP request object, since it lives inside that Django HTTP module, by convention, we usually call this the request. But again, you could actually just call this whatever you want. This could be jelly donut as a variable. It really wouldn't matter. But by convention, we call it request. And you'll notice that regardless of what is uh, passed into this function, it returns HTTP response and then this text, hello world. So each view must return an HTTP response object. And this very simple response object just is going to take in a string parameter representing the content of the page. So what I could also do is pass in some HTML in there, which we'll show later on. In order for us to actually see this view when we're running our server, what we have to do is map this view to the urls.py file. So I will open up here, first underscore project, and jump here to the urls.py and open that up. And you see here it tells you some information and it actually tells you uh, what to do. So if you want to add an import, you say from my app import views, which is exactly what we're going to do, except in this case, it's not my app, it's first app. So I'm going to scroll down here and you'll notice a what is essentially looking like a list of function calls to URL. And I'm going to add in one more over here and I will say call this URL function. And this is where it's going to look a little weird because we're using some regular expressions. So you may want to review those as we go along. But we'll just say our single uh, apostrophe there or single quote and then that little caret symbol or chevron it's also called and then another single quote. And sometimes Adam will automatically post a double quote there so just delete it. So that's the first argument. It's a regular expression and we'll explain what that actually means in a second. And then we need to pass in the views.index. But what I need to do is say this, from first app import views. So what is that actually doing? It's saying, okay, from that first app folder, import this views.py. And that means here I can say views dot, and then call that index function, which remember that index function is inside here, views.py. So that's exactly what's happening here. I'm just saying, okay, from that first app folder, grab views, and then from views, I can call index. And then I will name this. That's the third argument. I will just say name is equal to index. And remember to put in a comma here to finish off that list. So what this is doing is it's actually mapping that application's view to this URL. So I'm going to save this. Okay, with that saved, let's actually test out to see if this worked by running our server again. And then after that, in the next lecture, we're going to discuss URL mapping in a lot more detail and other ways of doing it. So I'm going to come back up here and say python manage.py run server, hit enter, and then in my browser, I'm going to jump back to this URL, I'm going to just copy this, put it in my browser and then let's see if it worked. Then you should be doing the same thing and hopefully if everything worked correctly for you, if I bring in my browser, you should see something that says hello world or whatever text you happen to put into that particular view.
All right, so we just created our first Django application, very simple hello world, but we were able to create that application, create that view, and actually map it to the URL in the urls.py file. Okay, so coming up next, we're going to discuss a lot more about urls.py, a little more about URL mapping, and some other ways to do it that are going to be a little more efficient and a little better. Thanks everyone, and I will see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back. It's time for a challenge lecture to put your new skills to the test. We've learned enough now that before we continue to learn more about URL mappings, we should challenge you to make sure you can test out your new skills. I want you to complete the following tasks. First, create a new Django project and call it something like Pro2 or Project2. Then create a new Django application and you can call it App2 or Application2, and this will go inside that new Django project. Then I want you to create an index view inside of that new Django application, and I want you to have it return this line, my second app wrapped in emphasis tags. So note that this is actual HTML code. The reason I'm asking you to do this is because I want you to explore what happens when you actually put a string of HTML code instead of just a normal string. Then I want you to link that view to the urls.py file and run your server to make sure it actually returned that new index view you created. In the next lecture, we're going to go through the steps of this challenge task. Best of luck, I know you already have all the knowledge needed to complete this task. But in case you get stuck on anything, you can refer back to the previous lectures or you can view the upcoming solutions lecture. Thanks everyone, and I'll see you at the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to the solutions lecture for the Django challenge. What we're going to be doing in this lecture video is just going through the solutions to the previous challenge together. If you were able to figure it all out, then you can go ahead and just skip this lecture. But if you wanted to see the process gone through one more time, feel free to stick around as I go through it. I'm going to jump to the Atom text editor to get started. Okay, here I am at the Atom text editor. Now the first thing we needed to do was actually create a new Django project. So I'll just go ahead and put this under that same My Django Stuff folder that we had earlier. Make sure you change directory so you're matched to it. And then what I will go ahead and do is say Django-admin, whoops. And then I do the start project command. Hopefully you were able to remember that. And then whatever you want to name the project. In this case, we'll call it something like Pro2. We'll hit enter. And then we can see here that the project two has been created. So under my Django stuff, I have this new Pro2 folder and it's ready to go. Then the next thing I needed to do was actually create an application inside of this Pro2 project. So what I will do is change directory to be inside of Pro2. So I will say CD to Pro2. And now I should be aligned with this manage.py file. So I can call that file and then call start app and create that second app. So I will say python manage.py and then the command I want to call for that is start app and then let's call this something like app2. We create it and we can see we have app2 inside of pro2, that project2. Great. Then the next thing we wanted to do was actually create a view. So I click here on view and here we say create your views here. So let's fill in the needed information. The typical view we've shown you how to do so far requires that HTTP response, and we need to actually import that. We will say from Django.http import HTTP response. And then we'll go ahead and create that index view, which is going to be DEF to create that function, index, and then it takes in a request and remember this can actually be called whatever you want, but by convention it's request. And we will return that HTTP response and pass in some code. And in this case, I actually wanted you to pass in some HTML. So we'll say my second project and then close off that HTML tag, EM. Now obviously you won't be passing in an entire uh, HTML string here for most usual circumstances, but I just wanted to show you what would happen in case you 
wanted to test out the capabilities of Django for this views.py file. So I will save that and then we need to link this new view to our URL. So I come over here to urls.py, scroll down and then we have the URL patterns list. And just like we did last time, I'm going to say from, and in this case, it's going to be app to import views, that views.py file. And then under URL patterns, I'm going to say URL, whoops, let's go ahead and tab that in. URL, using regular expression, I'm going to use, just like we did last time, the caret chevron with the dollar sign. And then as a second argument, let me make sure I only have one single quote there. I will say views dot index. So I call index off of that. And then we'll just give that the name index, comma to complete that. And then finally, I need to edit my settings.py file under Pro2 to let the actual project know that my app2 application actually exists. So again, we come down here until we see installed apps, and I will add in here as an argument that app2, and then I will save this. Then we can actually run our server and make sure everything worked correctly. Let's go ahead and do that. I'll just come down here and I will say python manage.py run server. Hit enter. Let's make sure everything works out okay. Looks like we're running it here. So I'm going to copy this, put it into my browser, and hopefully we see that string, my second project. And looks like it came out well. I'm going to drag it over. And we can see here we have my second project in italics. So it's actually able to understand that that's HTML when it reports back that view. And what I want you to do is sort of get used to this workflow of creating a project and creating